we've known Jeff for a long time, as I think activists tend to get known uh, in communities. And um, he was always so ebullient and excited about about the potential of the very difficult and hard work uh, he and Kim were doing. And so it was wonderful when this culminated uh, not only in a book, but in a lot of successful projects uh, around the state of Massachusetts and a lot of wonderful models for people throughout the country. Um, in, reading this, in reading this book, and I actually did read it, um, and I was glad I did. I skim a lot of the you know, books that we get. But this was uh, two things. One, incredibly readable. Uh, great language, uh, easy, but you know, once you got going, you were just sort of whetted your appetite for finding out more and more about what they were talking about. Uh, but I was I was struck uh, by some similarities. We have a wonderful professor here named David Rose, who has developed software for children with special learning needs. And the interesting thing about what he has um, what has been used so incredibly well with these students with special learning needs is as teachers are using it in the classroom, they have found to their incredible amazement, it works extraordinarily well with the regular students. And so they're calling it sort of universal learning um, with the, the sense that when you develop, when you develop uh, an approach that really works with a special group, that it probably has the capacity to work with lots of other groups too. And I was thinking about what Jeff and Kim and other people around the state have done. And even though in the book they're very specific about, you know, the, the problems of scapegoating of fat kids is bad, but it's not the same thing. You know, there's a, in their book they do not want a whole big lumping together of everybody who's ever been picked on in the world. Uh, they want to sort of uh, keep the specialness and the identity distinct. Um, but I couldn't help thinking that so much of what they prescribe has benefits for all students and that really what they are proposing here is not just for gay and lesbian and transgendered students. It's for making our schools civil and human and caring places and I really do hope that, that um, there's a kind of a campaign to have teachers read this because I think a lot of teachers will think, I'm, I, well, I'm not really involved with the gay and lesbian community and those students. They won't read this book. And I think the danger, I think that's a real danger. I think all teachers should read this book and all principals and all superintendents because I think the lessons that you highlight here uh, really have the capacity of bringing students and schools closer together. Um, and I couldn't help thinking about the students at Columbine who were so angry that they found a horrible way to take out their anger. Uh, there was the same sort of anger at um, athletes who seemed to walk on water in so many schools um, and to slur other people um, without, without ever a word being said. Um, and I thought, boy, if this book had come out maybe 10 years earlier and people had really taken action, there was, there's so many acts of anger that I think could have been averted. It's a terrific book. I hope you'll all read it, and then I hope you'll all give it to people who think that they don't really have a reason to read it. Anybody in education has a reason to read it. I want to thank um, Jeff and Kim for doing the hard work uh, of, of just plain being uh, with the Department of Education. They make some funny observations in the book about being with the Department of Education, and I'm sure we all know what those funny comments are all about. Um, but they've served as uh, director of the Safe Schools Program for Gay and Lesbian Students through the Massachusetts Department of Education. Um, and as if that were not enough, they really took the extra steps. For anybody who's ever written a book, you know what agony it is. It's just horrible. I hope it wasn't that bad for you. But this is just mm -hmm. a terrific gift to give the world. And we're so delighted to have them here. And they are going to introduce uh, the members of their panel, some of whom um, we've heard about before from other people who've been here to speak and all of whom uh, are just terrific to have before you today. So thank you all for being here. And Jeff and Kim, thank you for writing this and for doing your great work. Thanks so much, Dottie, and thank you very much. We're very grateful for your commitment to this work. Well, it's great to be here. We want to start with a couple thank yous and then find a little bit 
about uh, who's in the room here. We want to start with thanking Dottie Engler and Marla Blair from the Office of External Relations for putting on this event and uh, doing all the organizing and publicity around it. The Ask With Forum, the HGSE Pride Group uh, for all your work, and they are actually selling our book out there in the hall, so um, thank you very much for that. Uh, we also wanted to thank a few special guests who are here. Uh, our editor and our publicist from Beacon Press, Amy Caldwell and Kathy Dataman. Thank you. Beacon, it's been wonderful to work with Beacon, and we feel it's been a real privilege to have um, them uh, publish our book. And we also want to give a special thank you to our colleagues at the Department of Education. We certainly are part of a team in having done this work, and uh, we were all in this together. And we want to uh, thank um, over here, I'm very happy to see Mary Beth Fafford, who was the Senior Associate Commissioner at the Massachusetts Department of Education, now is at Brown University, and Tony DiLorenzo, who directs the Budget and Finances at DOE. They took us and our program under their wing, and anyone who knows about trying to do this work in a bureaucracy or an institution knows how important it is to have friends in high places, mm -hmm. friends and colleagues. So I want to give a round, have you give a round of applause to Mary Beth and Tony. I also want um, to acknowledge Pam Chamberlain, uh, Carol Goodenow, I saw Carol before, Carol, um, Abby Kinnebrew, where's Abby? Abby over here, um, I think that's it, right? Who's here from, and, and we'll also, you'll hear more about Michael, one of our past colleagues at DOE, um, for all their work with the Safe Schools Program for Gay and Lesbian Students. Um, so thank you. It feels like it's a repeat of the Emmys. Um, I also wanted to, to thank the people who are here from Harvard and realizing that, uh, that there are a tremendous number of resources at Harvard and that w some of the work that we do in this program is trying to hook people up with resources. And so it's great to be here where I see people like Polly Atwood and Michael Sadowski, people who have been doing this work in schools, who have been Gay Straight Alliance advisors, really on the forefront of this move movement. Also, Arthur Lipkin, who, if I'm not mistaken, was probably one of the first people in Massachusetts who was teaching curriculum about gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people at, um, at Ringe and Latin, and is now back at Ringe and Latin as the advisor to 10 East at Ringe and Latin. And I know there's people that I'm not mentioning, um, but it's just great to have you all here today as well. What we want to do, we'd love to have time, if you know the way Jeff and I do workshops, you'd know that we'd love to have time to just go around and have everybody introduce themselves, say a little bit about why they're here, but we know we can't do that because we do want to get out of here before 8 o'clock. So what we are going to do is ask you some questions, and if the answer to these questions are yes, I'd like to ask, we'd like to ask you to stand up. Um, <laughs> Stand up if you've ever worked in a high school, or if you work in a high school now. Stand up if you've, oh, sorry. <laughs> you can sit up. Right? Any good teachers know that you know, we need to have solid directions here, but we missed that, sorry. <laughs> Stand up if you've ever worked in an elementary school or middle school, or work currently in an elementary or middle school. Okay, thank you, may see, sit down. And the last one of, of this category, stand up if you work in a college or have ever worked in a college or university. Okay. Stand up if you're a parent. Yay, parent. Stand up if you're currently a student. There you go. <laughs> and stay standing if you're currently a student at the Ed School here. Stand up if you've ever gone if you've ever gone to a high school reunion with a same sex partner. Ooh. All right, let's give them a hand. And stand up if you remember a teacher in high school saying anything 
positive about gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender people? Stand up if you knew openly gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender students, and that could include yourself, when you were in high school. And now we want to ask a question related to the title of the book. Stand up if, when you were in high school, you were in the drama club. <laughs> I always wondered whether there was a gender difference here, but look around, it's pretty, pretty even here. And just to check out if we should have named the book something else, stand up if you were on the softball team when you were in high school. <laughs> well, boy, no gender balance there, huh? <laughs> All right. I just want to say a few words about why we wrote this book. We wrote the book because we believe there need to be many places in school besides the drama club or the softball team or other traditional places where uh, people have found support when they're not, not feeling part of the mainstream. We wrote the book to let people know that it's possible to address these issues in schools. It's possible to successfully raise the issue of homosexuality and sexual orientation in um, and gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender students, that you can raise this issue and raising it makes a difference. It's possible for things to be better and for people to change, for communities to change, for institutions to change, and it's possible for there to be a shift in the norms around who is valued in communities. Um, you'll, you'll be hearing from members of the panel here who are part of uh, the story definitely around have their own experiences around addressing these issues in schools many of you in the audience have also successfully addressed them and we acknowledge that here finally we wrote the book so that people would know that they're not alone that people are part of a larger movement and a larger group of people who are addressing these issues and um, and we wanted to tell the success stories to show people about what's possible in schools that um, it's possible to, ra to raise the issues, and these are the people who are doing it. So with that, um, Kim is going to uh, read something from the introduction. We just wanted to share a little bit with you from the introduction of the book to, to frame how we approach this book, how we approach this work, and also how the people who are here on this panel have made such an impact on their schools and communities. So I'm just going to read a little bit from the introduction right now. And what I'm reading here, we're talking about what it was like for us when we first started doing this work at the Department of Education and how we learned and learned about what was happening in schools and really how to do this work. People were eager to tell us what was happening in schools. We heard from a mother who was told she had to come and pick up her daughter because the principal could no longer guarantee this girl's safety. We heard from a student who got so used to spending his time in school looking down to avoid being harassed that he drew intricate pictures on his sneakers, giving him something more interesting to look at than his shoelaces. We heard from a class president who had a rock thrown at her head after she came out to the student body. How could this be going on in schools? Are things really this bad? We learned that things were this bad for many young people. We also began to meet amazing individuals who on a daily basis make schools better places. They are the teachers and counselors who take the time to know what is happening with their students. They are the principals and superintendents who respect human differences and create supportive environments for gay, lesbian, and bisexual teachers. They are the parents who actively become part of their children's schools. They are the students who are not afraid to stand up for the rights of their friends. They are the gay, lesbian, and bisexual students who proudly say, this is who I am. Walk into any school and you will find teachers who care about kids, teachers who are distressed to hear that students are hurting, and teachers who literally gasp when they hear the degree to which isolation can damage a young person's mind, body, and soul. Walk into any school and you will find students seeking justice as well as knowledge, students who want to create a better life for themselves and for others. The core of Safe Schools work is cultivating empathy and compassion. At the beginning of teacher workshops, we ask participants to stand up if they know, if they or someone they know is gay, lesbian, or bisexual. When the majority of people stand up, an important realization occurs. Members of the school community already have connections with gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. The feminist axiom that the personal is political is evident in the movement to create safety for gay, lesbian, and bisexual students. 
Rich personal experiences have fueled political action, and political action has created more opportunities for people to be open about their lives. This work is about building community. When students and teachers come together to work out a plan for their school, they find allies and form new relationships. Central to establishing relationships is finding common ground. Because there are so many adversaries in our fight for the rights of gay, lesbian, and bisexual students, we sometimes prejudge others and forget that we all have things in common. When people find the strength to act in spite of their fears, they often find support in unlikely places. One day, a gay straight alliance sponsored a workshop at its, schools, at its school. At lunchtime, the advisor worried that the cafeteria workers would disapprove of the event and possibly incite some backlash. After the workshop, one of the workers approached the GSA advisor and said, thank you for the work you are doing. My son attended this school 12 years ago and he had such a hard time because he was gay. I wish you had been there then. A middle school vice principal sat quietly through a workshop for his school district's administrators. About halfway through, he raised his hand and nervously spoke. I've been sitting here listening to all the difficulties facing gay and lesbian students and I can't be silent any longer because if I don't have the courage to be honest about myself, how will they? I'm gay. His colleagues showered him with support. An administrator at the Massachusetts Department of Education, Tony DiLorenzo, was moved to tears one day when he shared the details of his best friend's death from AIDS. His friend, for in rejection, had not shared that he was gay until just before he died. For Tony, supporting the Safe Schools program was his tribute to his friend. We have both been called Pollyannas. There is some truth to this label. If we did not believe that things could get better, we couldn't do this work. We take our cue from a student who wanted to come out, to, to come out at his school. When a counselor told him that she was pessimistic about how students would respond, he said, I need you to be optimistic. At the same time, we are not naive. We know that there are real risks in this work. People have lost jobs, friends, family members, and their own lives. We know that looking at personal connections alone is not enough. A complex web of institutionalized oppression makes it difficult for oppressed groups to make gains. Schools are fraught with larger societal problems, racism, sexism, homophobia, and class prejudice. The progress made in such places may seem slow and arduous, and sometimes it is. We acknowledge barriers to change and look for ways to overcome them. Plenty of scripts tell us what cannot be done. This is about what can be done. We have learned to value the small steps, putting up gay positive posters, speaking up against an anti-gay comment, adding one new book to the library, having two parents attend an after-school forum, starting a GSA with three members, merely raising the topic of gay and lesbian students. These actions are revolutionary. Whenever members of the school community step forward to support gay, lesbian, and bisexual students, they do so knowing that they may, met, may be met with strong resistance. The courage of these teachers, students, custodial staff, parents, social workers, administrators, and secretaries has inspired us. We feel honored to share their stories. Just as we, Jeff and I have felt honored to share the stories that we have shared in this book, we feel honored to have this panel with us tonight because everyone who's sitting up here has played a tremendous role in their schools and in their communities. And I want to introduce the first person, who is T.J. Kelly. And I want to just tell a little story about T.J. having to do with the first time that I met him. Um, he immediately endeared himself to me. It was at a workshop for schools that was being held on the Cape. And I was, it was pretty early in the morning and I was setting up some, a table with materials with brochures and booklets and stickers and those sort of things. I don't know if TJ remembers this or not. I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he walked up to me and basically said, no, no, this won't do. <laughs> because he didn't approve at all of how I was putting out the materials. <laughs> and <laughs> So, so he basically motioned to me to step aside, very nicely, I might add. And within three minutes, the brochures were swirled in, in just the right way. The books and the posters were tastefully arranged. And, and, and everything was looking beautiful. Now, I realize this is a very minor example of TJ's ability to get things done with flair. But as you hear him speak, you'll really get a sense uh, in a much deeper way about why he's been so critical in making his former school a better place. Both Barnstable High School and, and other schools on the Cape where TJ has been a speaker with the Cape and Islands Gay Youth Alliance. Um, and it's really an honor to introduce TJ today. <laughs>
I get very emotional sometimes. I like to cry. It's something I do. Um, I'm very nervous also because it's Harvard. <laughs> so I got all dressed up and it was very nerve wracking because it's Harvard. You look fabulous. So, um, where to start? Um, I guess I'll start at the beginning, where every story starts. Um, middle school was when it kind of all started. Um, I moved down to the Cape when I was in fourth grade. It was actually so elementary school. Um, and the Cape was very different from where I'd come from. I'd come from Malden. And Malden's a very city-like place and all this jazz. So the first day of school, I walked in and I had overalls that were spray painted with my name on the leg. And um, a bright blue t-shirt. And I noticed everyone's wearing dockers and boat shoes. <laughs> That's what they wear on the Cape. Dockers, boat shoes, and Gap. <laughs> Gap's a big thing down the Cape. Um, so I automatically felt very out of place. Um, that first day, I made the grave mistake of walking into the wrong bathroom. And I walked in. Oh, okay. <laughs> I walked into the girls' bathroom. Um, no sooner had I went in that I saw no urinals, turned around, came out, and there's my class. And that's where it all started. Um, in elementary school, it started with girl and pansy and all that jazz. And I didn't really get it. I didn't get why to be a girl was so degrading, I guess, because I liked girls <laughs> a lot. Um, so it was hard. As um, middle school and stuff progressed, the words got worse. Um, I remember when the word faggot was first used towards me, I had no idea what it meant. And I went home and I said, Mom, I said, I think someone said something nice to me today. And I told my mom and she said, Honey, no, that's not a nice word. Um, I learned to hide myself from there on. I need my water. <laughs> um, I learned to... Um, mix into the crowd. I learned to be the kid in the back of the class who didn't raise his hand and who didn't talk because I didn't want anyone making fun of me. I didn't want anyone to even know I was there because that's what it was like. I just wanted not to be seen. It was easier that way. Um, so entering freshman year, that was all middle school. Middle school was awful. I would go home every day and cry um, hysterically. And I didn't know why I was crying. I didn't even know I was gay at this point. I just knew that I was different, they knew I was different, and they were going to make it very visible that I was different. So I went into freshman year. That summer, going into freshman year, I did a play called Anything Goes, and um, I met this girl named Maria. I guess you can't really describe Maria without meeting Maria. She is insane. That's basically the way to put Maria. And she said, um, I like your flip-flops. And I said, I like your hair. And she said, want to be my friend? And I said, OK. It was as easy as that with Maria. Um, she didn't care about anything. She didn't care about what you looked like, how you spoke, who you talked to. It was just, if she liked you, she liked you. Just what I liked about Maria. Still wasn't gay. <laughs> so then she introduced me to this group called SIGYO, which is Cape and Islands Gay Straight Youth Alliance. Um, this was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, Sigya was a place where there was no limitations on what you could be. They didn't care. They didn't care. It was like Maria. It just did not matter. You could be whoever you wanted, and they were still going to say, hey, come party with us. Um, so Sigya was good. Sigya gave me people who are standing behind me now. I had people who are supporting me. And um, <clears throat> that year, this was summer before my freshman year. That freshman year, I decided, I'm going to come out. I'm going to do what I got to do here. And, I have these people now who can stand behind me and I can do it. So I did it. And I came out as bi um, first. And I dated like 10 girls, which we were talking about on the way up because I looked like a girl. <laughs> At this point, I had decided to be totally crazy and I dressed in girls' clothes every day and I wore glitter bracelets and glitter in the hair and I was outrageous. And it was finally a point where I did not care, which felt so good not to care what the person over there was thinking because I didn't. Um, so that was that. So I entered high school. And high school was actually easier than middle school, I found, because kids get a little, they grow up a little bit more, so they start to realize things. But it still wasn't easy. Um, I joined the GSA. My friend, my best friend Ryan actually was president of the GSA at this point. Um, and freshman and sophomore year were pretty hard. Um, kids used to throw quarters at my head. 
going down the hallway. I used to get tripped. Um, one point, my locker was completely defaced. Um, the constant names from people who wouldn't even show their face, who wouldn't even say it to my face, that they, they couldn't do it to my face. One incident in particular stands out in my mind where this boy completely bashed me for 10 minutes, and um, this is in the hallway. And um, I looked at him and I, I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm really, really sorry that you can't accept me. And I said, that's all I can say to you. I'm not gonna change, I'm just sorry. And I'm on the verge of tears. And I'm like, not gonna cry, I'm like holding up. And this teacher comes running out of the hallway and she's like, who the hell are you? And I was like, I thought I was getting yelled at. And she goes, that was so amazing what you did. She goes, your strength. She goes, I completely admire it. And I started to cry now at this point, of course. I couldn't <laughs> hold back anymore. Her name was Mrs. Rockwell. And um, she wasn't a GSA advisor. She was just a teacher. And she said, you know, we need more kids like you. We need kids to be strong and to stand up for what they believe in. Um, so then junior year, my best friend left. A lot of my friends left because they were all older. So I was kind of on my own. Um, I decided to take over the GSA and become president. Um, and the year I became president, we also got a new advisor. Um, so going into junior year, I hadn't met her yet. Her name was Claudia Smith Jacobs. We had talked on the phone, but I hadn't met her. And what a joy it was to meet this woman. This woman was amazing. She came in and she said, we're going on an outward bound. She had all these events planned and everything. And I was like, go on. I was like, okay. <laughs> and this is the point where it wasn't a club anymore. It was a family. We were a group of people who understood each other and got what we were all saying. We all were on the same page. And this woman, I can't find words to express what she does to me. She is just beautiful. She, every, I have to breathe. That's the problem too, I forget to breathe. Um, she just was amazing. That's all I can say. I wish all of you could meet her to know what this woman did. She and I had a bond. And that year we also did um, this beautiful photo display of gays on Cape Cod. Oh, I shouldn't say it like that. But it was, um, <laughs> it was gays on Cape Cod. That's what it was. It was pictures of different groups and stuff throughout Cape Cod of different kids. A lot of them were taken at SIGYA. Um, a lot of them we traveled for and took them. And it was, it was beautiful. Because not only with these pictures, we, every picture had a story behind it. And um, it was great. It was so positive from that point on. The group grew, we grew positive. We started getting recognized in the school. We got the um, two front cabinets in the school to display our stuff in. Because um, our principal thought it was the most important thing to display in the two front cabinets was something about energy and positivity and just was a good thing to put forward. Um, but I can really say that my experience wasn't that bad at Barnesville High School because of some of the teachers that were there um, that made it okay. Um, that's basically it, I guess. It was hard. I won't say it wasn't. Um, I met these two people along the way because um, I decided to do pub I just decided to speak at different schools and stuff. I got involved in workshops. Um, I got more involved in the community. And it's a beautiful community to be in sometimes. Um, these people are beautiful. This book, I haven't read it. <laughs> um, but it's good, you know. Um, it's a good cover. Um, what I'm trying to say is, this work is important. Everything that these people are doing, the Department of Education, is important. It has a purpose. Because you have to start with small groups of people and then it equals mm -hmm. out. It's not, like she was saying before, it's not just about gays, it's about everyone. It's that everyone here deserves to be treated equal. We all deserve to be smiled at when we're looked at and not have a look of disgust. So I guess that's what I'm here for. I just like people to know that, you know, we're all in this together in the long run. And the more you put people down, the more you're setting yourself back. So that's it. So I want to thank Jeff and Kim for inviting me to speak here, and I hope it was okay at Harvard. <laughs>
watching you, I saw how you were standing up so straight, and I was thinking of my <laughs> friend and advisor, Jeff Pike, back there, telling me not to, like, scrunch down, but to be standing high. So you, you're continuing to inspire me. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it reminded me, as you said, that you hadn't read the book, which but I'm glad you raved about the cover. It reminded me of just a quick story I want to tell, which is one of the first people, actually the first person who read the book. The phone rang one night, and I answered the phone, and the voice on the other line said, don't you guys ever stay home? And it was my partner Steve's grandmother, who is 89 years old, Nana, and said, I finished reading your book last night, and I just wanted to tell you that I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was going to be like a textbook, but I found that the stories were very interesting, and I found that I was glad that you spoke about the Grover Cleveland Middle School in Chapter 1, because I know that school very well. I went there, and I was a member of its first graduating class in 1927. So I'm glad to hear these things are now being discussed there. I said, I said well, Nana, we're going to have to get you back there to talk about what things were like when you were there now, too. And she was, she was willing to do that. So I think that she's a good example, too, uh, as TJ is, of people whose personal stories, they've recognized that their personal experiences uh, can be translated into something larger, that these are these are issues that are affecting a lot more than just people individually, but by speaking out on them, they're helping to change people's uh, lives in the schools. So the next person, next speaker I want to introduce is Diana Rice. And I want to introduce Diana by reading a short uh, excerpt from the book. Uh, we interviewed Diana and wrote about her in our chapter on sports, sexual orientation, and school climate. That chapter speaks to how important it is to address issues of sexual orientation in the sports arena, talking about the different ways homophobia gets played out in girls' and boys' sports. Diana has been a leader in addressing these issues. She has spoken to athletic directors, coaches, other athletes. She's been a leader in her school. Uh, she came out when she was in seventh grade and has, is captain of her soccer team, captain of her soft, uh, softball team, and um, you know, I have to, we wrote about all the awards that, and I don't know them all, but there's something like equivalent to like all American and all county and that sort of thing. She's really good. And um, her team did fabulous this year. They were like 16 victories, one defeat, and a lot of it was under Diana's leadership. And the section I want to read is an example of some of the great work she's doing at Wareham High School. And she'll teach you all how to pronounce Wareham. It's not Wareham. And, um, and the work that she's been doing there to educate people on a daily basis. Okay. In English class my freshman year, we were reading from our journals, and the question we had to write about was, what is your dream? What do you want? I wrote that I wanted to get married to my girlfriend, have kids, move to New York, have a nice house, become a phys ed teacher, and live happily ever after. Yay. I got up and read that in front of my whole English class. My teacher wasn't sure she had heard me correctly, <laughs> so she pulled me out of the classroom and said, are you gay? I said, yes. And she said, okay, I just wasn't sure I heard you right. <laughs> in that same class for show and tell, we had to do a, a what's in the bag sort of project. It was supposed to be things that represent you and your life. I brought in a pillowcase full of stuff, and the first thing I brought out was my hat, a rainbow hat that said dyke on it. It was my girlfriend's hat. Then I took out pictures of my girlfriend and me when we were in Provincetown together, holding each other. I brought a brochure from Building Bridges, a gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community youth group, because I was on the board, and I was really involved with that. I also brought in some sports stuff. Diana is part of a changing climate at her school where it is increasingly safe to be openly gay or lesbian. She is one of several out students. The GSA's picture is in the yearbook, and its banner is prominently displayed in the middle of the school. Diana and other gay, lesbian, and bisexual students were featured in an article in the school newspaper. When Diana was harassed on her softball team, she felt, quote, totally backed by her principal. He said, this will not be accepted in this school, and he took care of everything. Her positive experience is the result of systemic interventions, faculty training sessions, a gay straight alliance, state and local policies that have helped to create a welcoming school environment. Diana Rice.
Well, like TJ, this is Harvard, and I am a tad nervous. Um, <laughs> will you stand up here and talk? <laughs> um, I'm a senior at Wareham High School. Um, I'm 17 years old, and I guess my story starts kind of like TJ's in middle school. I came out in middle school, and I was 13 years old. Um, I don't remember exactly how I came out. It was kind of, oh, now I remember, okay. <laughs> Brain fog. Um, I told um, two of my best friends that I was gay. And you know how that is, you tell one person and they tell everybody and by the end of the day it was all around school and everybody knew and people were coming up to me, are you gay? And I didn't know what to say at first and then finally I was just like, whatever, I'm gay. And the whole school knew. And it was a struggle because middle school is not the age or the time to be coming out. Like, it's where you're finding out who you really are and people are really insecure about themselves and they don't really know who they are. But I did. Um, I was really popular in middle school um, and that all changed very drastically when I came out. I lost a lot of friends. Um, my father disowned me and my sister cried being my sister that she is she's very sensitive and whatever she cried and refused to believe it but then she got over it eventually um then later on i go to high school and i have to come out all over again because it's a new school a new environment and it was a lot scarier because i was like the freshman and there's all the seniors and everything else and i was scared that you know People are going to beat up on me. People are going to make fun of me. And that's not the case. That's not really what happened. But um, I tried out for the soccer team, and I made the soccer team. And I was the leading scorer for the soccer team. So I made friends, like upperclassmen friends. So it was easier for me. Later on, my freshman year, I played softball. And it was a game, I can remember, Wareham versus Case. And I'm the catcher of the softball team. And we have like cheers and stuff like that. And some girl, um, they were throwing this, like, I don't know if anybody knows softball, but you throw the ball around in like a star, like warm up, and they couldn't do it. They were horrible. They stunk. <laughs> and my team was making fun of them. And me, being the person I am, I don't like people making fun of other people. So I said, that's really unsportsmanlike. Please stop. So the, um, we're doing warm-ups and whatever, and we're doing throwdowns, and I'm throwing the ball down a second, and all of a sudden, everybody on my team starts screaming at me, dyke, fag, go home and screw your girlfriend, all this other stuff, and it wouldn't have been so bad, but they were my best friends. They were the people that stayed over my house every night of the week. They were the people that we stayed up until 3 o'clock in the morning playing pool, and doing stupid stuff around my neighborhood. And it hurt me so bad that my friends could do that to me. They were supposed to love me for who I was, and they never had said anything before about having a problem with me being gay, and then all of a sudden, randomly, at a softball game, they embarrassed me in front of not only the other team, but parents of the other team, and my family. And I picked up my catcher's gear, I took it off. It was in the middle of the inning. I took my catcher's gear off and walked for the bus and cried. And rather than my softball coach, which actually she wasn't there, she was watching her father um, get her get his doctorate or something. So it was actually not really the real softball coach. It was some other guy that was filling in for her. Didn't even say anything. I walked off the field and he put another catcher in. And they almost lost the game. <laughs> I was kind of happy about that. Well, kind of, sort of. Um, and they didn't even say anything. And then I got on the bus and I was crying. And then I was on JV at the time. And the varsity team was like livid. They were so mad. Um, I remember the captain of the team came over and gave me a hug and could not believe that you know this happened. And a big meeting was held the following day in school by the real softball coach in the auditorium. And she was like, you know, what happened? I was gone for one day and what happened? And her being, she is also a lesbian. So not only did, was she upset that this happened to me, but it hurt her too. 
because, you know, it's obviously a sensitive subject for her. And the meeting was like 45 minutes long, and everybody was telling their side of the story of what happened. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm not saying anything. I didn't know what to say, you know, like, I could not believe that my friends could do this to me. And finally, Miss Sylvia says that you can't even apologize to her or whatever. And then finally, one of my friends burst out into tears. One of the people that had said stuff to me burst out into tears. And I got up and I walked over and I gave her a hug and I said, you know, I forgive you. Because you need to forgive and you need to learn from it and you need to move on. That's the only way things change. And... But then more things happened and other people were still angry and were still saying that I was a dyke and a fag at this meeting. So I got up and I walked out of the meeting crying and went to um, the principal's office. And the principal um, pulled me into his office and he said, I'm not going to take this. This is not going to happen in my school. And he is one of the best principals. I can honestly say that my school is an awesome school and my administration backs me 100% in any situation. If I want something done, all they need to do is go in their office and say, this is, hey, this is what I want done, and they do it. They're great. I love them. <laughs> I can't, like, I can't say enough about them. Like, I, I mean, he put his hand on, his shoulder, on my shoulder and was just like, you know, everything's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of everything. You know, he was like, how far do you want to take this? Do you want to take this to the police station? However far you want to go with this is I'm behind you 100%. Um, at this point, I had a GSA um, in our school up and running because of my English teacher, because she felt a close connection with me and wanted to do something for me, so she started a GSA with me. Um, and I can remember going to, her off, going to her room and crying to her many of times because of people making fun of me, hard times in, um, on the field, with other teams, people saying stuff to me from other teams, calling me names and stuff like that. And I can remember crying to her, and I can honestly say that she was not only my English teacher, she was my friend. She was like a mother to me. Like, I love her so much. I love everything that she's done for me. Like, she's writing my college recommendations, like, for me. Like, she's an amazing woman, and she's a strong woman, and she stood by me. Um, I can't say enough about her. Our GSA um, tends to bring people that are different to our GSA, and it's a gay, straight youth alliance, and people will say, well, all gay people are there. Well, I'll tell you right now, in my GSA, there's probably like five people that are gay and the rest of it are straight. And they are from the drama club, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> but I really think you should have named the book a softball something. Yeah. The sequel. The sequel, yes, there will be a sequel. Um, yeah, a lot of them are in the drama club, and they're the people that tend to not fit in in school. They're the people that aren't really like nerds, but they're kind of like freaky with like blue hair and stuff like that. It's a place where they can go and be them themselves, and no one's going to judge them. So we're now creating a safe environment for everybody, not just gay people. I guess that's my story. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Diana. Our next speaker is Heidi Delisle, and I just have to tell a brief story about her journey here today, because Jennifer Davis Kane was uh, originally on the posters to speak, and at the last minute today we got a message that she had an emergency at work and was not able to come. So I was sitting there thinking, who could we actually call at this point that we know that we're so confident in and um, she may be able to help us out and that it would be also a privilege to have um, to share with you. And so I just without thinking any more, I called Heidi Delisle at 3.30 this afternoon. She answered at Middlesex Community College. She answered the phone directly and I said, Heidi, I need your help and explained to her what happened. She said, what time and where, you know, we're there for each other, we're all in this together. I'll make a couple calls and I'll be there. So that says who Heidi Delisle is. And um, 
So I just want to thank her and recognize that to start off here. I also want to say that Heidi has been an educator. She's been in the trenches. She's, again, somebody who, as an advocate for her daughter and from her own personal experience, has um, learned and broadened that to share it with people and expanded that to um, many audiences and recognized the gift that she has in speaking. She's a speaker for PFLAG, Parents and Friends and Families of Lesbians and Gays. She's out there at every event at Youth Pride last spring. She was at the front of the parade dressed as Tinky Winky on a very hot day. <laughs> with that, I want you to give a warm welcome to Heidi Delisle. <laughs> That's quite an introduction. <laughs> you should have seen my Halloween costume this year, though. <laughs> I went as SpongeBob. <laughs> SquarePants, do you know him? <laughs> I know. The college students knew him where I, where I work. <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to be here. Um, I've been invited to speak as a parent, um, kind of about the experiences that uh, my family has had in, in uh, coming to terms with my daughter, Emily, who identified herself as uh, a lesbian at a very young age. Um, she's now 19. She's out at UMass Amherst and is having a wonderful freshman year there. It's a great community, and it's a great place to go to school, and I have a huge hole in my heart. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm very proud of her. Um, as a parent, you never know the journeys that you're going to be taking with your children when they're born. <laughs> you never know. And the past. I don't know, about five to seven years uh, of being Emily's parent. Um, we have learned so much. She has taught us so much. And um, I'd like to share a few of those things um, that we've learned with you tonight. Um, Emily came out to us, in other words, told us that she was a uh, lesbian when she was 13. Um, actually, she had known a lot earlier than this. And if you ask her, she'll tell you that she never knew any differently. Um, she always knew. She just didn't have the words or even understand that that was different. Um, she always liked girls. I remember when she was um, eight years old, she said, you know, Mom, I really, you know, like girls. My girlfriends, I have girlfriends, and I really like them. And I, she was 10, and she told me the same thing. And I really, as a parent, didn't know how to respond to that. I said, you know, the, you know, classic parent in denial. Well, I have lots of girlfriends, too, and I care deeply about them. And it's a phase. <laughs> You're going through everyone cares deeply about their girlfriends. And... I was at a loss, and um, I didn't know how seriously to take this or what to say. Um, I never, I, I'm one of the people that, you know, stood up. Did you know, uh, did not stand up. Did you know kids that were gay when you were in high school? No, I didn't. No one was openly gay when I was going to high school. That was a few years ago. <laughs> um, I only knew adults that came out when they were, when they were adults. Um, when Emily was in seventh grade, she changed a lot. She'd been a happy and a confident kid. Um, you know, wonderful student involved in things at school, and she started spending a lot of time in her room, closing her door in her shades, listening to music. Um, we didn't know what happened to the kid that had been such an important part of our family and such a contributing member. Um, when I tried to talk with her, we'd end up arguing. Um, she cried a lot that year, and so did I. Um, I did the only thing a self-respecting mother of a depressed teenager does. I read her diary. <laughs> you got to do that. Oh, my God. We're still friends. <laughs> as awful as that, that sounds, um, what I learned was far worse, and that was that she was thinking of taking her life. And that has got to be the most frightening thing that a parent can ever face. Emily felt so alone. At home and at school, she'd been hiding who she was for so long. She felt there was no one she could talk to. She felt different than her friends. She was afraid of what her friends would think if they knew. Um, I remember my husband telling her at that point, she hadn't come out, he said, just come downstairs. He said, sit with us and don't stay in your room. Just come down, watch television with us. If you can't talk to us, at least just sit with us and be with us. We don't want you to be alone. And it was during this time of several months over the winter that she began to talk about herself late at night, and that we finally started to listen to her. You don't know Emily, but she's a very serious, a very thoughtful, and a very introspective kid. She knows herself really well and always has. And when my husband and I really considered who she was and what she was trying to tell us, we finally accepted the fact that this is who 
Emily is, um, that she's a lesbian, and this is something she knew all along. Um, the funny thing in the whole course of our discussions with her, she kept telling us that this was the one thing in her whole life that she was really sure of. I mean, plenty of things she wasn't sure about, but this was something she knew. Um, she never doubted it. Um, she always knew, even though she didn't have the words to tell us. I remember thinking very clearly that um, it didn't matter what I felt about all this. You know, I had a kid that was so depressed and so lonely that uh, she was thinking of killing herself. And I could love her or I could lose her. And um, for me, that, that wasn't a choice. Um, mostly, Emily needed to know that she wasn't alone, um, that there were other kids that felt the same way that she did, that were the same way that she was, that, um, uh, that she could identify with. She sure didn't think there was anyone else at her high school um, that would understand. Um, we found a group in Boston. I don't know if you know of Boston Glass. Uh, they used to be a mass app. I don't know if they still are or not. But um, it was an after-school group. Um, it's a uh, gay and lesbian adolescent social service. That's the last. And um, so I took her into Boston. We'd drive every day, I mean, every, you know, Friday, Thursday or Friday, they'd have activities or movies or whatever. And she found kids that were um, gay, straight, questioning, accepting. And um, she felt, she learned that it was okay to be gay. Um, she didn't get that message from her school or from society or even from us at first. Um, it made a huge difference to her to go there and to feel like she didn't have to hide who she was. Um, she could talk to, to friends there, meet, uh, you know, meet other adults and other kids that, that were gay, straight, or questioning. Um, she heard about gay, straight alliances at first there uh, that had been formed in other Massachusetts high schools. And so she and her friend um, from school uh, went to the health teacher and said, gee, you know, could we do this here? And um, the health teacher was very wise, and she said, we can't start this without some kind of support from faculty or from the principal. And so she arranged a teacher meeting, a uh, faculty meeting, and Emily, at 13 years old, came out to the entire faculty and said, this is who I am. And, um, you know, I spoke to the faculty and talked about my journey with Emily, much like I'm talking to you now. And um, the faculty was sort of jaw-droppingly, they just realized, wow, is that what it's like to be, to be gay in the high school, to feel that kind of isolation? They couldn't believe that someone was gay in the high school and that it was Emily. Um, they finally understood how hard it was to be in that homophobic environment. Um, they responded really positively to Emily's story. And, um, she found a supportive group of teachers and a supportive principal, and that's made all the, all the difference in the world to her. Um, she's graduated, she's gone to college, as I told you, and the GSA is still there. She has a 14-year-old sister who's uh, still a member of the GSA, and um, you know, like in your schools, they have, now have a bulletin board, and they have pizza parties, and the Gay Street Alliance throws the best dances. <laughs> They're well decorated, and they have lots of refreshments, and they have the best music, and they have a DJ, and so um, it's okay to be gay, and it's okay to belong to the uh, Gay Straight Alliance. They have their picture in the yearbook, like at your school. Um, um, they see DOE leaders at, out at the high schools doing community forums and working with the teachers and faculty that um, are articulate and good role models, and that, that makes a difference, um, that kind of leadership. Um, they, all students, not just gay students, need to see people like Cam and Jeff speaking out for the tolerance and out for um, promoting understanding um, of differences, especially in high school where same is so important. Um, these leaders, her principal, her health teacher, um, the DOE people, um, really challenge students to examine their prejudices and their biases, and this, this is important. This is important education. Um, as Emily would say, it took us a very long time to finally become the parents that she needed us to be. <laughs> but we finally get it. <laughs> we've seen Emily's difficult struggle to be herself at home and at school. And we've seen the differences that education and openness and confronting homophobia in the schools has made in the quality of her life and in the quality of ours. And it's up to us as parents, as educators, to ensure that continuing um, effort to confront prejudice, to, to teach tolerance, and to support GSAs and uh, maintain safe places like that in the schools. Um, I'm grateful for the work that DOE does and for 
other people in this room that does to that end. And um, it's made a huge difference in my daughter's life, and it's made all the difference in the world to me and my husband and our family. Thank you. Next, I want to introduce Michael Kozak. And you heard from TJ and from Diana how important it is to have teachers in schools who are supportive, who they know will back them, and who they know really care about all students in the school. And that's one of the reasons I'm happy to introduce Michael. I'll just say a few words about him. Michael was the second person hired to work at the Department of Education for the Safe Schools Program for Gay and Lesbian Students. Um, he was absolutely critical to the success of the program. He was passionate about, um, about schools and about making sure that students had the best, best possible experience in schools. He, um, he was very organized. <laughs> he ran the Student Speakers Bureau and conducted numbers and numbers of faculty and student workshops across the state. And we unfortunately lost him to Harvard because he decided that he liked schools so much that he was going to come to the ed school here and that he actually wanted to be a teacher um, and not be working in the bureaucracy anymore. Um, in that bureaucracy. In that bureaucracy, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And, um, yeah. So anyway, he, um, one of the things that I remember when I did workshops with him for students that often got said about Michael is, one, he's so cute. <laughs> and two, he's just so cool. And it's really interesting because I just got this letter in front of me from a, that a student wrote to him. Michael's now a history teacher at Newton South High School. And I'm just going to read a little bit because I'm, what I'm seeing from this letter is that things haven't really changed that much. So he, this, is, this is the end of a letter, that, a very like a three-page letter that this student wrote to Michael. And he said, I've been educated by you. You're one of those teachers who can be and is seen as, and then quotes, cool by students, and that description comes well before, and he's gay. If someone even says that, mostly not. I think it's cool how you answer questions and educate the heterosexual majority population. It's cool how you're cooler than most teachers. <laughs> I'm glad that you're not an English teacher. <laughs> it's cool how you're cooler than most teachers about all topics and aren't quick to be offended, but are quicker to educate. Jeff is from being your student for a couple of times around now, Mr. Kozak. You, that still sounds funny to me. You've opened my mind and made me more accepting and changed many preconceived notions that I might have had prior to being in your class. Just wanted to tell you, you, you represent well and definitely could change someone's whole idea about homosexual people and that I've been educated by your example. And so, I'd like to hear from Michael. Thank you, Kim. Um, an incredible uh, introduction. Um, I, I, I want to say uh, thanks to Kim and Jeff for um, writing this incredible book and having us here today. I, I can't um, really um, appreciate them enough for the work that they did with me when I worked at the Department of Ed and making me a better person, making me a better uh, leader of workshops and, and, and working with kids. I mean, they, they really have um, done tremendous work in this state. Um, I need to also thank um, two other people because without these two people, I would not be standing here today and be participating um, in a career that has been the most rewarding um, and fun job that I could ever have. And uh, I, I really feel honored to be in the profession of teaching. And those of you who are teachers or have been teachers, you know what an incredible experience it is. And um, the, the first person is uh, a man named Bob Parlin, and he's a teacher at Newton South High School, and I'm going to talk about him a little bit more. But he is really the reason I became a teacher. And how I got there was uh, a man named Warren Blumenfeld, and we were talking about activists who have been around for a long time and have been doing some work. And uh, he really has been my mentor for so many years. And, um, and uh, he is the one who, when I was looking for a job in the last recession, um, <laughs> I think we can call it that now, mm -hmm. but um, he's the one who called uh, Jeff Parati and said, you know, I've got this person who just graduated and, and could help you a little bit um, around the office. And um, he didn't know it then, but he was 
certainly putting putting in touch two people that uh, could not be more different in their working styles. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, Michael, you don't have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. But ultimately, it was that difference I think that that made us a, a team, and um, we really did uh, show that I think diversity is really a strength, and and not something to to um, you know kind of look look negatively at. So. Um, I, I also wanted to um, just talk about a question that um, you guys asked at the beginning that I found much harder to answer than I, I thought I would. And the question was, um, uh, if a teacher in high school ever said anything positive, and I, I stood up because I saw that in my experience, uh, homosexuality was mentioned. It was mentioned once. And in that split second, I saw that the mentioning at that point, and mentioning just once, was a positive thing for me. And it's the one thing that kind of helped me continue on throughout my high school um, career. And um, I, I, I really want to um, encourage people to do one action step, one thing that can make a difference in, in people's lives, because it, it, it um, certainly has had an effect on, on my life. So um, I want to talk about a little bit about how I, I, I got here. Um, Back to uh, a couple of things. I want to talk about basically uh, um, three issues tonight, and we'll see how they can um, get connected. Uh, one is um, bell hooks. Another one is uh, triangles. And um, another one is uh, the sense of allies. And I, I want to um, come back to that a little bit at the end. And um, the first thing is that I, I never thought I would become a teacher. Um, it was something that my mother did, and she was my substitute teacher at one point in, in kindergarten. Um, but I never thought I would actually be in front of a group of kids trying to teach them a subject, let alone lessons in life. And um, once I came out, I thought all of that was completely gone, um, because there were no gay teachers. The only gay teachers that existed were the ones that we whispered about in high school, um, or uh, mentioned in, in, in negative uh, context. And it wasn't until I began working at the Department of Ed and met Bob Parlin, who was an openly gay teacher, that I began to think that it's possible. It's possible to be a teacher and be who you are. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that is, is what this movement has about, is about being who you are as you continue through an education. Um, and the, 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 the we were going out to a workshop out in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and it was an incredible day. Um, we were driving down the Massachusetts Pike about mm, 60 miles an hour, probably too fast, and because it was snowing, and it was just a, an incredible day. And we were talking about um, Bob's experience at Newton South High School. And he expressed in that um, conversation how much he um, loved teaching, but also what his experience was uh, being an openly gay teacher and how, um, in fact, what he was worried about was that students, once he came out, would shy away from him, was not the reality. What the reality was that he felt closer to his students and they felt closer to him. And I thought, there's something that I can work towards in terms of being an open and gay teacher. And that's when I decided, it was in that conversation at that moment that I thought teaching is something that was right for me as I had to write on my Harvard e essay. Um, um, coming into Harvard, um, it was a little nerve-wracking, because as people said, it has a bit of a reputation. There you go. <laughs> um, but I did, there was a summer reading that was the reading that really inspired me and grounded me in uh, what I was going to do throughout my teaching career, and that was the uh, book called Tre Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. And I hope you still read it here, because it was the one book that, as I said, really allowed me to understand myself and where I wanted to take teaching. Um, part of that was transgressing, but part of that is also um, really being a human being in the classroom. And one of the, one of the quotes in the book that stuck with me throughout my time in thinking about how I was going to be a teacher was the idea that if you want your students to be uh, confessional in the classroom, if you want to per them to participate, if you want them to um, actively engage in the material and also their lives, you need to do that too. 
that it is your responsibility as a teacher to do what you're asking your students to do, or else it's creating an unfair power advantage in the classroom. And that was, I, I think, one of the things that really inspired me to say coming out was what I needed to do, because I wanted them to be human beings in the classroom and share what they um, were thinking about the material and how it related to their own lives. And that was what um, inspired me as I became a student teacher. And it, it was also um, a mentor teacher that began helped me think about how I would actually come out. And that was thinking about teaching as a triangle. The one end of the triangle being me, the teacher, another end being the students, and then the other side of it, of course, being the curriculum. And how do you pull all of those three things together? And it was within that that I was thinking about how could I explain to my students that I was an openly gay person, that was someone that I was in my Department of Ed career, and I was going to be in my teaching career. And uh, we were doing a lesson on freedom in my uh, 10th grade class. And I thought, OK, well, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about freedom and the freedom to be who you are. I was asking my students to write an essay about freedom, and I was going to talk about freedom um, as well. Well, my ninth grade students preempted the question. I was talking about the Aztecs, and I don't know how we got from the Aztecs to this question. But at the end of the lesson, they said, Mr. Kozak, were you in the military? <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is an odd question. And then another one raised their hand, Mr. Kozak, are you married? And I thought, OK. And I wasn't ready at all to deal with those questions. And I said, well, you know what? We're going to hold off on that question, and we'll get back to it later, and then I'll have, we'll have a chance to, and I'll talk about myself. And it gave me a chance to think. And of course, the first person I went to talk to was Bob Parlin. Um, what do I do? And um, I began to think about uh, the, the triangle again, and also being really um, thinking about how I would answer the questions honestly. And it, it came to be a lesson for me back into the curriculum about the issues of freedom, discrimination, and of course, gay and lesbian people um, can't be openly gay in the military, can't get married still. And so it was a, it was a lesson of how we could deal with the issues of, of civil rights, justice, and that kind of stuff. And, and so then, uh, at that point, it was, I really did have to come out to the rest of my students, because as you know, they tend to talk. So. Um, <laughs> I was luckily hired by Newton South and continued to uh, work in the school. And what I have to do is continually come out to them um, because I think it's one of those things that even though the students tend to know through whispers, it's something that um, if you don't come out again and again, there's conversations that happen that you aren't able to um, really let students know what you're thinking and allow them to talk about the issue in a way that's uh, really an open dialogue. And so. I've continued to do that as well as my activities through the Gay-Straight Alliance. And that Gay-Straight Alliance has also been a source of real uh, support for me as a teacher because the, it is a Gay-Straight Alliance. And it was really important to have a heterosexual ally be an advisor to the group. And this um, ally has been right there with me every step of the way, fighting as hard as I have. And that kind of fighting by an ally is what keeps me going. It's saying that, wait a minute, this is as important because sometimes you, I think you begin to question yourself. What am I doing? Is this really important? That kind of thing. And then when there's someone right next to you fighting just as hard, it really helps you to continue to move forward. And ultimately, in Newton, we, do, we are quite lucky because since the work of other teachers, there is a group now called Angle, another triangle. Um, of teachers who are openly gay or are going through the process of, of coming out. And at this point, there's 50 to 75 people who are members of this group and are actively working in our schools, both elementary, middle, as well as the high school, to make Newton a, a safer place. So ally groups and, and uh, community groups can be really helpful in the process of school change. So I wanted to thank you again, and um, we'll be taking questions, I assume. OK, thanks. Thanks, Michael. You are a natural teacher, and uh, I thank Warren for that call that day. Uh, the next speaker I'd like to introduce is Jim Pugh.
and it's a real privilege to introduce Jim to you. I'm going to read a section of, of our sports chapter also where we feature Jim and uh, talk about some of the wonderful work he did with Corey Johnson. Corey Johnson, people may have heard, was the co-captain of the football team who came out at Masconomet Regional High School two years ago and his story and experience on his football team and in his school received uh, international attention uh, because not only that he was a football player who came out but because of the positive reception he received by his team from his team his coaches and from his community and in our chapter around uh, which we title uh, it's possible finding support in the athletic world one of our major themes throughout the book which is featured here is finding support in what seem to be unlikely places and uh, Jim Pugh is um, uh, it was a real it's been a real privilege getting to know you and getting to work with you it's definitely one of the joys of doing this work when you can work very closely with the school and see people as courageous and influential and effective as Jim is in his work. So I'd like to read a section where we talk about in the sports chapter around the work that um, Jim did. Corey's coaches also stood by Corey even when they were uncomfortable. Their main concern was that Corey's being gay would become the focus of the season, that the stories in the local paper would be about Masco's gay captain and not on Masco football. Corey assured them that he didn't want to do anything that would take the team's concentration off football. He agreed to postpone any media coverage until after the season. Although the coaches were relieved that Corey was not planning to have ESPN at their first game, they were still afraid that reporters would get wind of Corey's coming out and start asking questions the coaches weren't prepared to answer. So over the course of several weeks, we helped them to become more comfortable around gay issues and to practice responses in case reporters approached them. We had already had an encouraging first meeting with the head coach, Jim Pugh. Not being athletes ourselves, we were a bit apprehensive at the beginning about how, how well we would relate to him. In an effort to speak his language, we read the sports page of the morning paper so that we could connect over sports news. When we got to the school, before we, we could even display our newly acquired knowledge about the New England Patriots, Jim began describing the details of his recent excursion to Broadway and extolling the virtues of Bernadette Peters' performance in Annie Get Your Gun. As he recounted, there's no business like show business and you can't get a man with a gun among all the wonderful songs in the show, and even started humming a few bars, we were caught off guard. Sorry, Jim, but you have to give us a moment to regroup. We weren't anticipating talking show tunes with the football coach. Jim smiled sheepishly. Apparently, he had also made an effort to find common ground in preparation for our meeting. <laughs> I always like to say, if the football coach is singing show tunes, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> During one meet, um, through these meetings with Jim, we developed a mutual trust. He introduced us to coaches, parents, players, even to reticent athletic directors from other schools as his friends. Becoming part of the Masco sports community was central to having a positive effect on it. The success of what happened at Masconomet was built on the development of relationships among Corey and his teammates and teachers, among his coaches and parents and us. An early challenge came when a prominent parent in town, the head of the football boosters and father of the team's quarterback, raised the question of whether there should be a revote for captain, since the team hadn't known that Corey was gay when they elected him. Our colleague Deb Levy was at a meeting with Jim on the day this came up. A former basketball star at Amherst College and a lesbian she and Jim bonded quickly over college basketball. When the revote issue came up, she said matter-of-factly, there are always players and parents who think someone else should have been elected captain. I'm sure you've had to deal with this a million times. Of course you can't give in when people start with the captain complaints or you would be having revotes all the time. It was just what Jim needed to hear, to be, re to be reminded that he knew exactly what to do, that the situation was nothing new, and that it did not merit being handled any differently. The next day, he went to this parent and delivered a clear message. If you're worried that Corey's being gay will be a liability to the team, what you're doing now is much more divisive and damaging than Corey's being gay could ever be. There's not going to be a revote, and I don't want it to be brought up again. I'm pleased to introduce Jim Pugh. Thank you. I guess first I want to 
thank Jeff for um, letting everyone know about my show tunes. I guess I'm out of the closet. Exactly. Say, yeah. right. of you. you may as well sing a few bars yeah. now, Jim. Get it over with. <laughs> no, actually, thank you very much for, for inviting me. And, and I guess I'm here because Corey Johnson was a very courageous young man. A lot of you have, have heard the story uh, or read the story or seen it on TV. And I just wanted uh, to talk about why I think it worked in our community, in our school, and on our football team. Uh, I'm a special ed teacher. Uh, I don't introduce myself as a football coach. I enjoy coaching football very much. I enjoy working in special ed. I've been working at Maskinomics since 1979. But they're two different hats. And, and as a football coach, I don't, we don't process things like in special ed or in the alternative program. <laughs> and I think one of the things <laughs> As we went through this, Jeff was very, very helpful, and Deb Levy, and, and some of the other people in the school. But it was not for the football team. It really was a question where we said to the kids, Our, we have one rule, and it's do the right thing. And I mean, there was no question in, in, in our mind, as coaches, as adults, as I mean, teachers, what the right thing was. And, and the enjoyable thing, and, and what made this really uh, quite moving for, for us as coaches is that the team did accept Corey, they liked Corey, and they had a very easy time doing the right thing. Um, our school, I just found out tonight, I didn't realize that Kim had come to do a workshop uh, a couple of years ago. We were in the forefront of doing workshops, dealing with a lot of different issues for the last, since I've been there. And I think that's the type of school that it is. I have a good friend who's an athletic director at one of the other local high schools. And when I told him the story about Corey and how he was coming out, his first comment was, I don't want to have to go to a workshop, you know, at, <laughs> regarding this issue. And I reassured him that we weren't going to have a, a league meeting to go over this. But Maskinomit is the type of community where it, people are accepting. And I think that came out with, with, the, with the kids on the team. Uh, my daughter goes to one of the, uh, just graduated from one of the other local high schools. And she was saying the same, same thing in her school. I, don't, I think that most kids, and, and this is really through the work of a lot of people around here, it really is an acceptance of, of differences. And there is a tolerance out there. I know the football team. And I think, TJ, I heard you, uh, and this was two years ago when we, were, we got an award at Tufts at the Teach Out, talking about some of the football players and how traditionally they are the jerks that are, that are harassing uh, some of the kids who were different. And I, and I think that what was nice was that our team wasn't like that. I mean, I'm sure they have done it. I'm sure they will continue to do it. But it's something that's, that is not accepted in our school, and that's because of the, the administration. I think it's because of uh, the workshops that are done. So that set the tone. The, the kids on the team were friends with Corey. Now, Corey was a very outgoing. He was, he's very uh, popular. He's a good-looking kid. He, the, no one on the team ever suspected that he was gay. And when, when he did come out, I think Jeff talks about it in his book, but we, we had planned a meeting. And at the meeting, Corey was going to talk to the team and tell them exactly uh, why he had become so involved in the Gay Straight Alliance and why he was, he was going to come out. And it was, for me as a teacher, it was incredibly rewarding to sit there and, and one, listen to a young man share so deeply something that's so personal, but two, which was, which was great, was the reaction of the players. We only had our juniors in there. He, Corey had been voted at the end of his junior year football captain. We had all of the juniors at the meeting in, in my classroom. And to every single one of them just sat there. First, their mouths dropped a little bit. I guess they were a little bit. They, they had no idea why we had called the meeting. It was in the middle of the school day. But when he did, when he made the statement, 
I, I don't even, I, to tell you the truth, I can't even remember which, which player it was, but his comment was, Corey's our friend, he's always been our friend, and we are supporting him. And, and that's the way it was. Some of the leaders of the team, our other co-captain, was great. Because there were a lot of kids, there were a lot of younger kids who said, ah, I don't want to be associated with, you know, the football faggot. They started, you know, kids in the school would, would call in names. And the, the, the other leaders on our team st stood up, told the kids that, you know, this has nothing to do with, with, with Corey's personal life, but that he is a member of the team. And we would handle that the same way that, that we would handle any difference on the team or, or any kid that might not, for, for one reason or another, when kids don't get along. And they do the right thing. And, and he did. And Dave was, was a great leader. Talked to the younger kids. Talked to the older kids. And uh, it, was, it was just, it worked out. It was a very good situation. Um, in terms of, Jeff asked me to talk about maybe some of the effects. I talked with some of our kids today. And I just came from practice. And I don't think this, I think it's a tolerant school. I think we accept differences. I think that will not change. I think that um, the language is the one issue that most of the kids said where they really have learned how, how using terms like gay and faggot can really hurt someone. And, and that's probably the biggest lesson that they have gotten out of it. And I, I went to a workshop with one of the local high schools where they asked me to talk about how, what the experience was like. And I, I can remember that. A woman that I work with has been saying that for years. When kids use the term gay or faggot, she tells, stands up and confronts them and says that, you know, she finds that offensive. And I think that's, those are the kinds of things where, by Corey just talking to the team and talking to the other players, it really did make a difference. They, they listened to him. They, and they said they, you know, they watched what they, you know, the language that they used. So it, it was, it was an enjoyable, it wasn't always an enjoyable experience. I mean, there were a lot of days where it, it, it was a struggle. And Jeff, I will say, was very helpful because it was just someone that, that I knew I could talk openly with. I could talk about some of our concerns how we didn't, I mean, that was true. We did not want this to be a season that was focused on the gay kid. We wanted it, I mean, it was, it was Corey's senior year, and he had, you know, we, we were very excited for him. But it was also there were 20 other uh, seniors, and it was their season too. And we didn't want this one issue to overshadow their, their season. And, uh, and, and Corey and his family felt the same way, and Jeff, uh, I mean, people supported us, the school supported us, and I think it, it turned into a, um, a very positive situation. So uh, the long-lasting effects, I think it's just the culmination of all the work that our schools and the communities have done, and, and it affected the football team as well as everyone else at school. Thank you. It's really hard to be the last person that, on a panel like this. And, um, but I have every uh, bit of faith in Laura Shalaha's ability to be the last person on this panel. And I just want to say a couple of words about Laura. I first met Laura when she applied to do an evaluation of the Safe Schools Program for Gay and Lesbian Students at the Department of Education. And when she applied, we knew that she was somebody who was smart, she had great credentials, and we also knew she was good at juggling a lot of things at the same time. When she did the evaluation of the Safe Schools Program, that was a three-year evaluation, she was a full-time student here at the Ed School and Doctoral Program. She was teaching research and evaluation at BU, and she was also working at Wellesley. And on top of that, she seemed very excited and, like, excited and like she would be able to handle the, doing the evaluation, and we were impressed with her application. So we had high expectations, but I don't think we completely had a sense of how incredibly tenacious she would be about doing this evaluation. She managed to get 43 schools to participate in this evaluation. She surveyed over 1,500 students and nearly 700 school personnel. Um, 
for those of you know, who know what it's like to get into schools to do this work, that's just completely amazing. And she wouldn't have gotten this large of a sample if she didn't have a certain amount of tenacity and a certain amount of chutzpah. Um, if a principal said that, if a principal didn't respond to, um, to mailings and phone calls about being part of the evaluation, she would actually go to that school uninvited and go to the principal's office and say, I'd like to speak to Mr. or Ms. so-and-so. And if they said that person was in a meeting, she said, that's okay, I'll wait. And she would. And she actually got schools to come on board by doing that, which I, I haven't worked with schools. I just think that's phenomenal. So she's here today to give us a little bit more of a macro perspective on the work, um, taking what people have been saying in their personal experiences and talking about what that means in terms of numbers, data, and evaluation which can be exciting, as Carol Goodnow, our researcher at DOE, would be glad to tell you. Hi, good evening. It's uh, not too late, I hope. I have to tell you how utterly delighted I am to have been invited and to share in this evening with you. As I've been listening to my colleagues on the panel, I've been struck by my own progression, a sort of a, a personal timeline, having been a lesbian high school student, having been a high school teacher, uh, to sitting right in this auditorium, which I still call Longfellow 100 rather than Asquith Hall, uh, to evaluating the Safe Schools program, working with Kim and with Jeff. I called Jeff up and, and asked him, what do I have to do to get this contract at the DOE? And he met with me and talked and that sort of thing. He wasn't working at the DOE at the time. No, 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 no. I just want to be clear about no, that. No, in the I was sitting over here and see our chief financial really? officer. Uh, but I wanted it to. Wasn't really. This is true. I wanted to publicly acknowledge how far we have come and how proud I am to be associated with such fine human beings. Um, my remarks this evening are actually composed of two parts. First, I will share with you a little about the evaluation. Kim told me that I was allowed to give you a few numbers. And then I would like to talk a little bit about research regarding LGBTQ issues. Two of the major goals in evaluating the Safe Schools program were to determine what I called the sexual diversity climate of the schools. That is, what was the overall atmosphere regarding sexual diversity as perceived by the students, by the faculty, the staff. And secondly, to examine whether that climate differed across schools based on the implementation of the Safe Schools program, with some particular attention paid to GSAs and to staff training. The evaluation was from 1998 through 2001, and I did take a big Q, little Q approach. Uh, that's not big queer, little queer, someone suggested to me <laughs> at one time, uh, but rather basically quantitative with the qualitative pieces connected to it. And uh, actually, Kim already told you about the, the numbers of students in schools and uh, interviews with people and that sort of thing. I conducted a multi-level analysis of the data using PROC mixed and SAS, but I am certainly not going to go through all of that with you. If you're tremendously interested in that, the, the thesis is in the library. But I do have just a few uh, numbers for you from the students. 35% of the students in schools with GSAs reported that LGBT students could safely choose to be open about their sexual identity at school, in contrast to only 12% at schools without GSAs. Now, this is sort of a good news, bad news sort of piece. Because you have to say, well, on one hand, in the schools where there are GSAs, less than half of the students feel that they could be safe uh, in being out. On the other hand, the students in schools with GSAs report safety in numbers three times greater than the schools without GSAs. I know why I like to be a statistician. <laughs> Fifty-four percent of the students in the schools where the staff had training reported that the LGBT students felt supported by their teachers and their counselors, in contrast to only a quarter of the students in schools without staff training. From the faculty and staff, 40 percent of the staff in schools with GSAs reported that they would be comfortable in assisting a student with sexuality questions or getting them to somebody who could do such in contrast to less than a third in the staff of the schools without GSAs. What might be surprising to you is that 30% of the students 
and over 45 percent of the faculty and staff indicated that there was too little time spent on LGBT issues in their schools and that they wanted to spend more time doing this. Wanting a teacher, a teacher wanting to go to a workshop is an amazing thing, but it's really true. As you might expect, GSAs had the greatest measurable positive association with the students. And staff training had the greatest uh, positive association with the professional staff. What again might surprise you is that the GSAs had a more positive association with boys than with girls. Those of you who know GSAs know that heterosexual boys do not make up the majority of members of a gay-straight alliance. <laughs> And yet, in fact, having the GSA in the school made the difference such that the boys who had nothing to do with that reported on an atmosphere that was less homophobic and was aware of what heterosexism actually was. The evaluation, I love this evaluation, the evaluation provides credible evidence that educational interventions can and do mitigate homophobia and heterosexism in schools. I would be remiss if I didn't caution you about causality. <laughs> the most important limitation uh, of the work, Carol Gooden, I was laughing over there in the corner, is to be aware that we cannot conclude that the presence of a GSA or a staff training in and of itself was responsible for positive or negative differences. To do that would require a more complex longitudinal study requiring a great deal of money that I'll be talking to you about later. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, mentioning complex longitudinal studies reminds me of the second part of my remarks, and I've tried to watch the clock a little bit, but I want to highlight the research that is still to be done. I might look a little tired to you because I have been burning the midnight oil writing a chapter on the present challenging questions in adolescent development questions that need to be addressed. And so I'm busy reading all of these books to be certain that I haven't missed any of the more recent work that has been done while I was scribbling out my thesis. So I opened the text, published in 2000. It's uh, entitled Studying Adolescent Development, written by some of the stellar scholars that you have all sat and listened to. I turned to the index in the back and looked up sexuality. It read, see pregnancy and STDs. <laughs> There is so much work to be done. <laughs> For those of you with a psychological bent, and I am an HDP alum, uh, as you know, much of the focus in research with LGBT populations, especially with adolescents, continues to overemphasize problematic aspects of adolescence, alcohol and drug use, depression, suicidality, and underemphasize the study of normative development. We need to research and refine an integrated model of normative sexual minority development. Now, apart from my agenda, there is a ton of other research to be conducted. I'm one of the founding associate editors of a new journal, as is Arthur Lipkin over there, uh, the Journal of Issues in Gay and Lesbian Education, an international quarterly devoted to research, theory, and practice. Under the expert guidance of the editor-in-chief, a scholar many of you may know as he taught here last year as well, uh, Dr. James Sears. In our discussions of themes and topics, the ones that come up for us to, to be soliciting articles and themes on are gay and straight alliances, transgender students and teachers, the value of LGBT educators, for those of you with a, more of a leaning towards discourse, the intersection of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality in schooling, queers of color in public schools, especially administrators, multiculturalism and queer pedagogy, effective strategies for reform of educational policies, queer consumption and youth cultures, measures to encourage and ensure participation of LGBT youth as equal partners in the formation of educational policy, and the list goes on and on and on. For the ed school students, I want to emphasize that your research can be done here. My advice to every student with whom I have ever worked has been to follow your passion to do the research to which you are truly, deeply committed. Otherwise, it's just too damn hard. <laughs> There's been a real movement and change in the atmosphere at the Ed School. As a first-year doctoral student, I was told that studying LGBT adolescents and their school experiences was a special interest. It was not a concern of educational psychology or policies as a whole. And yet, in, my, in response to my doctoral proposal, 
five years later, the COD wrote that the school climate for LGBT students is an important and timely issue which warrants further study. I look forward to reviewing your manuscripts in the near future. Thank you. <laughs> thank our entire panel again for adding so much to this evening. And we have time for a handful of questions. Um, and so I just want to leave it open for about the next 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. Hi, I was curious about any efforts that you're making or projects that you're working on to promote the Black Lives Yeah, thank you. Um, not, not to use the title that Laura um, just said about the intersection of, um, I'm not sure how she put it, but the book itself does have a chapter looking at race and gender and how one of the things that we found in doing this work is that you can't really separate, you can't do this work well and separate questions about sexual orientation and, and race and gender um, within schools because they are connected. They're connected on a number of levels. One is that young people have multiple parts of their identity, and so that you have young people who may be African-American and gay, um, maybe Latino and gay or lesbian, and that if we only look at one part of a person's identity within the school culture, young people aren't going to feel safe. So if it's not safe for kids of color in the, in the school and it's not safe for gay and lesbian students, it's basically just not a safe school. And it is, so it is something that, as a program, we've been looking for more and more ways to make those connections, um, be looking at race and gender. Um, and what we found, we've been doing a fair amount of work with Boston Public Schools. Um, and actually, Boston has hired a half-time person for the last couple of years who's specifically working with students in Boston Public Schools. And that's primarily youth of color within Boston Public Schools. And that's an initiative that we're very proud of and feels like we're learning a lot when it comes to working in other school systems as well. I don't know if people want to address that at all from, from the field. Um, I'm from Wareham High School and our school is mainly um, a lot of black students and we have a multicultural club and I was also involved in the multicultural club. And we try to collaborate with the GSA, but it doesn't always work because there are a lot of black basketball players and stuff, and they don't really like us. But um, yeah, we do like have a lot of black students in our school, and we try to collaborate and work together. Because that's the only way you get things off the ground is when you collaborate with other things. So it sounds like there may be some work that needs then to be done as well with the sports teams, if yeah. that's if that's an issue in the school as well. You can't really make someone's decision for them. If someone's doubting, they're doubting. That's all there is to it. All you can do is show them that there is resources for them if they do have questions about it to come to and get answers. Um, we had many kids, I've dealt with many <laughs> young men mostly <laughs> come to me, but um, about who are unsure and how to figure it out. Um, you, can't, you can't give someone the answers. You can just provide a path in which they can find their own answers on which is the best way I find to put it. Um, I, th I think Newton uh, schools are doing a pretty good job. I think we have a long way to go. There's a couple areas where I think it, it can help. Um, one is in our sexuality and health curriculum. Um, there's a specific area where we deal with sexual orientation issues and questions of sexual orientation, and I think that's really important. Um, and that leads also to curriculum. 
Because if you can uh, institutionalize the ideas of talking about sexual orientation and sexual identity, and it's not just in one area or it's not just the gay teacher who's talking about it, then all students are being impacted by it. And I think it's really important in our English classes, in our um, history classes, in our math classes, talking about statistics. You, you, can, you can utilize uh, the curriculum to really uh, broaden the conversations and actually get kids more interested. I, I find the kids are incredibly hungry to talk about this and find answers around sexual orientation. The, the third aspect where I think um, we've been doing a pretty good job at, at reaching the kids who, who might not be part of the GSA it's, is through a um, series of workshops, usually uh, right before um, the winter break, where um, every block during the day we have an awareness program. It's called To Be Glad Day. And I think it's our 10th or 11th this year. And last year, we had a series of homophobic graffitis uh, that took place in bathrooms, and it was just a very difficult year. And our principal, who's a new principal, was quite good at helping us to, to continue to move, move in, the, in a positive direction. And, and on the day that we had the To Be Glad Day, we uh, asked that all students, and he encouraged this over the loudspeaker, that all students wear our school colors to show solidarity for gay and lesbian, bisexuals, and transgender students. And when we had the programs in our auditorium bigger than this, a couple times I was incredibly moved because it was just a sea of kids wearing our school colors, uh, blue and orange. And those programs throughout the day really reached a lot of kids. And I think that's the kind of all school activities that you can do to reach kids who might be questioning, might need some information. And um, then usually what happens is after those programs, our membership in the GSA goes up. So. I'll just speak to that for, for a second. I think uh, the process that Kim and Jeff talk about in the book in terms of doing activist work, um, you know, we didn't have a law for students back uh, in 1992. And it was through the efforts of students, through uh, political uh, folks, and um, people, activists who were working on the front lines to get these laws passed. I think that's, that's one important area. The other important area that I think has been an incredible uh, support for teachers as well as students, actually throughout the nation, has been GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. And um, it's for gay and lesbian and bisexual people as well as uh, heterosexual allies. And I encourage you, wherever the state you're going to be located, to get in contact with GLSEN because they provide lots of support, resources, and, um, and as well as conferences to learn more about these um, uh, activities and how you can really change the climate to be um, more supportive. So I really encourage that. Also, just very quickly, I'd add that there are other federal laws that can provide protection in certain, particularly with students, more so with students than with teachers, but there are some federal laws that are applicable even in states that aren't quite as, um, that don't have laws quite as good as ours. I think that sometimes behind that question is often the concern that people couldn't do it in other states that aren't as progressive or supportive. And I think the message that we like to really put out strongly is that we firmly believe that this work can happen anywhere, and there isn't one school that we went into in Massachusetts even that said, you don't understand, we're different, we're conservative, it's a conservative community, it's not going to happen here in the same way. So we recognized that it really was random around the communities in which it took place. It was urban, suburban, um, and rural, and it really relied on just whether there were some people willing to take the risks. And secondly, to follow up on that, not do it alone, but find where your allies and, and places of support are because they existed in every community. want to be discussed in school at 
Um, at that age level, I mean, I completely agree with you on the sex thing, but at that point, it doesn't have to necessarily be a gay focus, I feel. I think it just has to be a focus on acceptance in general, that it doesn't have to be, a, it just doesn't have to be a gay thing. In middle school, it should be more of a everybody thing. It's more of an accepting of everyone. That's my, that was my biggest problem was it wasn't just because I was gay that I was being made fun of, but there was a girl sitting next to me because she was wearing Kmart clothes. That's why she was getting made fun of. So it's more of a level of intensity there with acceptance of everyone. That's where the focus would have to be, I would say, especially in middle school, because then you have to deal with parents and signing slips. And <laughs> um, I'm finding now, I'm a middle school um, phys ed teacher now. It's a school to work program at the high school. and. It's changed so much since I've been there, and it's only been four years since I've been there. And what I'm doing to try to make things change and educate them is when they say things like, that's so gay, or things like that, I call them on it. And, I mean, some of them catch me off guard because, like, I don't think they have a clue that I'm gay, and I don't think it's really, like, something that's going to be discussed or I'm going to share with them because I don't think they're mature enough to handle it yet. Because things have changed since I was in middle school. And I think it, I don't know, something, well, how the world is evolving or something, that we're getting, like, younger and younger or something and living longer. But um, that's my theory, okay? Um, but it just seems like they're not ready to handle it. But there are kids in middle school that are having sex, and I think that it needs to be addressed. I know parents don't want their children that they think aren't having sex, um, being educated about it, but I think it's very important because then you see kids getting pregnant in middle school and stuff like that, so I'm, like, totally for, like, educating in sex and um, gay issues and stuff like that. I mean, the other thing that both of your comments bring up to me is comes from, from the first question that we had from the audience, which is they you can't just look at sexual orientation. There's issues around class, there's issues around race, and it's issues around identity. And so if you bring all of those pieces together, you're more likely to have, and, and in middle school, that's actually much easier to do, to talk about people's identity. It gets harder around sexuality education, which is not to say that it shouldn't be done, but just that it's harder. Um, I'm getting the we need to wrap up sign, unfortunately. I'm sorry, I can't take another question. Um, but I do also want to mention that there is a chapter in the book on elementary and middle school issues as well. And I just want to thank you, and I, I wish we had more chance to hear from people in the audience, because just watching your reaction to this wonderful panel, I could see a level of engagement and interest that makes me feel confident that there are going to be people here at the Ed School who are going to leave here, go to schools, and do wonderful things, and make schools better places, and make communities better places. And that's the kind of inspiration that whenever we talk about this work, we always come away with that kind of inspiration, knowing that there are people out there who want to make a difference and who will make a difference. And so thank you to all of you who are here today.